and I have that it is 101. If the rest of you um, want to just try to vote, and then I'll close these polls. Getting a last minute flurry of people signing on. That's wonderful. Hopefully, everyone can hear. And I do want to introduce myself. Um, I'm Laura McDermott. I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension in the Capital District region and do um, vegetable and small fruit extension education. And I'm working for Dr. Marvin Pritz on the Northeast IPM funded webinar um, series that we're putting on with a great deal of help from invited experts throughout the Northeast region. So uh, our thanks to the Northeast IPM Center for their funding assistance and to all of the uh, research researchers that we'll be hearing from over the next um, several months. And also uh, my great deal of thanks go to my colleague Kathy Heidenreich who is, has been instrumental in trying to get the um, press releases and all the PR out for this series and for Dr. Marvin Pritt's guidance in it. Um, so let's get on with it. The first uh, session that we have scheduled today is Alternative Strawberry Production Methods and it features um, two guest speakers, uh, Kathy Jemchek, who's the Senior Extension Association associate at Penn State University. Kathy has a background in vegetable and fruit nutrition and has been integral to berry and plastic culture research in the state of Pennsylvania. So we're really happy to have her and I'm actually going to let her begin our um, begin our talk here in just one second and I'm jumping ahead slightly. I want to make sure that everybody sees um, these additional resources that are listed here and those are things that you can uh, access by not clicking on, they're not live um, links, but you can cut and paste them into your browser if you're interested in any, in any, any of those resources. And it, just in case people are still not aware of how to do this, if you have a question, please type in this skinny box at the bottom of the chat and either hit return or hit send message arrow. And I'm just getting um, a little feedback from Sue that the sound keeps breaking up. I'm sorry Sue, I, um, I wish I knew how to fix that and hopefully it, it's not breaking up for other folks. My audio and I'll give you a ring. All right. Um, so let me move now into the classroom and I'm going to introduce Kathy Demchek again, a Senior Extension Associate at Penn State University and I'm going to turn off my um, talking and give a call and I'm going to um, just turn so this much. over to Kathy Demchek. Well, already I'll jump into this. Um, at this point, if anybody does have questions or anything, um, feel free to type them in if we end up um, getting too many questions in and it gets um, too distracting, we may end up um, holding them for the end. But for now, I'd say if there's anything that I'm talking about that's unclear to you, please feel free to just type something in and I'll try to um, not get um, myself too far off track on things. Alrighty, um, what I want to talk about here is northeastern approaches um, that are used to growing strawberries on plastic. Now most of the information does apply to the northeastern United States. For those who are um, a little west of here, um, there are some folks from Ohio, for example, or in the Midwest, um, most of what I will talk about would apply to those situations as well. So we're going to jump into things here. Um, you know, the most common reasons we get for why growers are interested in growing on plastic um, are listed here. Weed control is probably the number one reason that people give um, when they're growing strawberries in matted row production. 
Um, often they just get tired of trying to deal with the weeds and the plastic helps with that problem. There are some other advantages. There is um, a shorter time to establishment than you might have in matted row production. Um, typically you can plant during the summer or early fall. Um, and still harvest the next spring. So it cuts off several months um, that, um, during which problems might develop. Typically you'll get um, better quality fruit primarily in the area of size, um, but flavor can, can also be excellent with plastic culture berries. Typically um, the fruit will come in um, two to three weeks earlier. Um, d but that really depends on your management. Um, that doesn't have to happen if you're in a frost pocket. There are some things you can do to um, to keep the fruit from coming in too early if frost is a concern for you. Higher marketable yields. Um, you may not necessarily get higher total yields, but um, if everything is managed well, um, hopefully you will get a higher percentage of fruit that is marketable, and your marketable yields will be higher than they might be in matted row. But again, that's not necessarily true either. Um, berries will tend to pick faster um, in that if you have larger berries, um, your labor costs can then go down um, for, for berries that are picked ahead and sold as ready picked. And um, a lot of our growers are getting a higher price for plastic culture berries because of the higher quality. Now, here's the disadvantages. Um, plastic culture berries are expensive to establish. If you were using plug plants, which um, are the type of plants um, for which um, the system was originally developed for use with, um, they're expensive at about 21 cents per plant um, and a plant population of around 15,000 plants per acre. Um, the cost adds up fairly quickly. So you can you know, spend $3,000 on plants alone. Um, it does help if you have both trickle and overhead irrigation. The trickle is a necessity. Um, overhead, ne overhead irrigation um, will come in handy in a couple of situations, like for frost control. Um, and then plastic mulch, there's issues um, with the cost, but also disposal um, and, and just the environmental costs of using um, a lot of plastic can be an issue too. F the um, one other expense that's fairly large is a row cover. That can be as much as $1,500 per acre, um, depending on the row cover you're using. And management in this system is, is intensive. So, um, you know, there's some, some potential there if you aren't able to keep up with what's happening in the planting, um, where you can get into a little bit of trouble. And all that puts it together into being a, a, a high risk um, type of um, situation, but um, there also is a potential for high returns if you can get everything working together well. So plastic culture, as it was developed for use um, in the southeastern United States, um, where basically it was adapted from production systems used elsewhere, um, in that situation, um, typically plug plants are used, plants are planted during the fall, either late September or early October. Um, in that situation, there really are less times for, there is less time for problems to develop. Typically fumigation will be used. Um, there will be high raised beds that will warm up quickly. Um, most of the production is with either Chandler or Camarosa, and it is used as an annual system. When we take it to the north, um, typically um, we'll need to move that planting time um, to be earlier, either into mid or late summer. You may use plug plants, you also may use dormant plants, and we'll go into some particulars on that. Growers may or may not use fumigation um, if they can rely on crop rotation. Um, they may not need, need fumigation. Typically most of the beds um, that will be made for plastic culture here are lower than in the south. Um, most of the growers will use um, plastic mulch laying and bed raising equipment that they will also use for vegetable production. And um, Chandler still works really well here, but there are um, some other varieties that can be used. And typically growers may carry plantings over um, for a second year. So we will go into that uh, more as well. Um, just in case um, you aren't familiar with plug plants, this is what a tray of plug plants would look like. So when I refer to those, you, you know what we're talking about. Basically they are runner tips that are taken from plants um, rooted in, um, in this case, a 50 cell tray. And then um, it'll be vegetative, actively growing plants that, that um, are planted. 
Okay, so um, some of the modifications we use for using this system in the northeastern U um, U.S. really depend on understanding how the plant grows and responds to the environment. If we understand how the plant is likely to respond um, to different techniques we might use that modify the environment, then we might know what to change if um, we need to increase our yields further or just want to try some different things. So first I just want to talk real briefly about how strawberry plants do respond to the environment. Um, runners are produced um, during periods when you have long days and high temperatures, um, our, our typical summertime conditions. and um, so what that means is when we move planting dates up, we may run into some, some issues with, with runner production, with having more runners than we actually want. Um, under conditions of cool temperatures and short days, like we have in the fall and the early spring, um, you'll have branch crowns formed on plants. And um, those, those are basically you know, side branches um, on the mother plant. Um, each of those branch crowns can produce one or two fruit trusses. And so we're really dependent on having those to have high yields from a particular plant. And then when we have periods of short days and long nights, um, that's when flower buds are initiated. That'll happen in the fall. Um, it also can happen in the early spring as well. But this is something that isn't strictly temperature dependent or strictly day length dependent. Temperature can affect this as well. Um, finally, how the plant responds um, can depend with a um, cultivar, and so um, this also explains why some cultivars do better in some areas of the country and not so well in others. And so, like I mentioned, um, modifying any components of the system will affect how, how the plants respond um, and what kind of yields we'll get. So, you know, in a nutshell, when typically we were using um, plastic culture in warm areas and we'd use um, plug plants planted in the fall, you'd end up with high yields that would result from having um, numerous branch crowns formed. And um, also, once those branch crowns are formed, you'd still have um, a fairly long period for flower bud initiation. So you could get high yields from those individual plants planted in the plastic culture beds. In matted row production, where we were planting um, dormant crowns in the springtime, um, our yields are really dependent on having full beds. So you'd have those runners and daughter plants produced during the long days of the summer and then um, flower bud initiation taking place on those plants during the fall. So even if we got an early fall, if we um, just had a short period for flower bud initiation, we still had a lot of plants out there that could, could still give us high yields. And all of that might be, you know, a bit of an oversimplification, but that's kind of, you know, um, in general, how, you know, some of the thing, how some of the things work and um, why we need to make some of the changes we need to make. So plastic culture in cooler areas, some limitations we have. We do have a relatively short fall, um, a short growing season in general, and then um, cold winter temperatures, and we need to uh, modify some things to deal with all of these. So issues on um, that short fall season. If we are using plug plants, one of um, the first uh, field studies we had done was looking at planting date and that's what we you know often recommend people do when they're considering um, trying plugs in a plastic culture system is determine their optimum um, planting date for us in central Pennsylvania um, which at our research farm is Hardina Zone 6A just to give you an idea of you know where we're starting from on this um, we needed to plant our plants by the middle of August this is an issue because there just aren't enough plug plants available early enough to supply the demand for them um, in, in northern areas. And even when we thought we would be able to get plug plants, um, we didn't always get them when we thought we would. And so what that meant was sometimes there would be delays in planting um, that often frequently happened for growers. And one thing we found was that for each two week delay we had in our planting date, we basically cut our yields in half. And so, you know, that's, that's a big problem to have to deal with because you just can't get the yields that you need to be able to pay for the inputs um, in that kind of a situation. So we want to look at some other alternatives for um, what we can do here. Okay, if you um, can't get plug plants, 
Um, you can try to route your own plugs from runner tips that you can order from nurseries that sell them. Even then, you can sometimes run into um, issues where the nurseries um, may not um, have, the plants may not go into runner production um, to the extent that they need them to f um, due to just weather conditions or, you know, for some reason they've had some sort of a failure and um, you just can't, still can't get the tips. Another option is to use dormant plants that you can plant directly into the um, raised beds instead. And then a third option is to basically turn um, dormant plants into plug plants. And so we'll go into um, and each of those Ka just a little bit. Kathy, I'm sorry for interrupting, but yes. there's one question from Paul yes. about uh, what is a plug plant. It sounds like you're uh -huh. going to talk about that here. Yes. So sorry for interrupting. Yes. Um, no, no, I'm glad you did. I, I failed to notice that one. Okay, that is a plug plant right there. And what that is, is, um, well, I'll go into it a little bit, but, but basically what you do is you take a tip off of, um, off of a, a, a runner that is, um, you know, on a mother plant, and then you root it into a medium in a tray. And so it'll look like this little vegetative plant, and we'll go, I'm going to flip back forward here, um, into how you do that. Um, pretty much you need a mist system. Now I'm not going to go into all the details here because that could be another, you know, 10 minutes in itself, but um, there is, I, I, I'll call your attention to it right now, um, down the um, small fruit consortium down in southeast U.S. Um, www.smallfruits.org um, at that site um, right there um, what you can you, you can visit it and there is some information on on producing your um, own plug plants um, we also had um, an article back in it um, in Penn State small fruit and vegetable gazette, yeah, vegetable and small fruit gazette back in June 2004 that hopefully you'll be able to google or use a search engine for um, and find that article but it does give you details on how to do this but basically what, what you will do is um, Either, either get runner tips from a nursery. Um, you may be able to produce your own, but you do want to absolutely make sure that those plants are clean. You don't really, um, you know, just want them to be grown, something that you've gotten that's, you know, from a planting where they're just running out into the row middle. You'd like to be able to c keep them clean with some sort of, um, some sort of way to um, keep them clean, perhaps using a landscape fabric or, or plastic um, on the ground. But what you do is you will cut the tips um, off, of, off of the runners. Um, you want to do that when they're just starting to, to unfold their leaves. It'll take about 35 days um, from the time you cut those plants, um, stick them into a growing medium. Um, It'll take about 35 time days from the time you do that until you have, um, in, until you have um, a rooted plant that you can use. Um, you need to do this, um, like say, you typically we'll use um, trays that have 50 cells in them. You'll want to use a, a media that's fairly well drained. You'll need a way to anchor them. Um, hairpins work really well, actually, for just um, holding that little um, runner tip down. You just leave a little stub on it. You anchor them in, keep them under mist um, that you gradually decrease over the period of about two two weeks. Um, and then um, you just let them harden off, um, or at least well, you, you wean them off of the mist, and then um, they're good to go. So um, I just, just do want to point out that you do need to make sure you have a clean source of those, and they are fairly, um, you know, like I say, fairly easy to root yourself, but it, you do need to have the time and some sort of structure to protect them. So, you know, there are some inputs into doing that. Um, the second option, which is probably um, the best, best option um, for northern production um, is to use dormant plants. Um, there you can plant them anytime from June through July. And um, the issue with that, we talked about how plants will runner during the summer, is that once you're on plastic, you do need to remove the runners during the summertime. So they can go um, crawling off of the plastic and root in the row middles where you don't really want them. Um, so that's sort of an, an issue um, for, for them. So 
you'll need to do that. You still have almost a year till harvest time. The one thing I do want to point out if you're using dormant plants is that um, temperature really has a big effect on the quality of those plants. So if you get them too early, um, and you don't have the conditions where you can keep them really cold, and by really cold we mean 30 or 31 degrees. We don't even want them up around 35 or 36 degrees um, because they, they basically will start to use up some of their carbohydrate reserves um, at those higher temperatures. So we really want them to stay at the nursery or in a location where they're kept cold enough um, until you can actually plant them. We've had some growers get into trouble where they've lost maybe 50% of the plants. Um, and, and, you know, they'll just, you know, be, be in a real trouble at that point because then they have difficulty getting, getting replacement plants. So um, we do want to mention that. Um, there is a planting tool that you can use, and rather than um, try to use any kind of a mechanical planter or anything like that, we actually do recommend planting those um, by, by hand, and um, basically you will use um, this tool which looks almost like a na nail pull or a metal nail puller that you might use um, to, to push the roots down in um, into the soil, and that works surprisingly well. What we do is just poke holes in the plastic first to mark where they're going and then use the tool to, to push the plant roots down um, into the ground. And again, if you go to the www.smallfruits.org website, there is an article there where they have photographs um, demonstrating how you do this. And um, that their um, write-up is actually for fresh dug plants, which are green plants that we can't use this far north. But, um, but, but the principle is still the same and the root system still is very similar. So, you know, that gives you an idea of, of how it works. And then if you can um, water them um, after planting, that really helps with getting them established. When we've used dormant plants, um, you know, if, if the plants are in good shape to start with and we can get them watered in, we have very good establishment with them. And it's nice to see the, the note from Kip there that, um, that he can get good establishment too. So it's, you know, not just us in our, in our research plots. Um, where can you get the planting tool? I'm not certain whether Norse Farms, I believe Norse Farms may have it or they may have instructions on how to, how to make one. Um, I know some of our growers, if you see what the pictures look like, um, it's actually something that is fairly easy to make yourself. And, and I actually did end up using our nail puller, um, which was about a foot long metal you know, metal thing with a V-notch um, in the end, and it, it actually worked pretty well. I was a little concerned I might chop the roots off with it at some point. Um, but anyway, um, I have seen that, boy, I'm trying to think of Indiana Berry. There were a couple places with the nurseries where I've seen planting tools um, advertised. Um, one other thing I want to mention on the dormant plants is that um, there is a lot of interest in using apogee. There had been research done in Massachusetts, and um, ah, Marv, thanks. Um, there, there was research done uh, in Maryland, Maine, and Massachusetts, where they found that apogee did increase the number of branch crowns and decreased runner production in trials. So there is grower interest in that because it results in, in higher higher yields. Um, but that's not a labeled use yet, so I just want growers to be aware of that. Um, we're hoping that in a short period of time, within the well, relatively short period of time, within the next couple years, um, that we that label may come through. Alrighty, so dormant plants, another advantage with them is that you do have a choice of cultivars, um, a wider choice of cultivars than you might with plug plants. But I want to point out that not all of the cultivars um, that can be used or work well in matted row production may work well in um, plastic culture. Um, is there a similar product to Apogee for organic users? Not that I am aware of, um, to answer that question there. Um, yeah, that's something we may just need to, to hold off on for a while and, you know, see if there's some, some other way um, of dealing with that for or organic folks in the future, but I would be surprised if anything um, came through any time in the near future on that. 
Um, let's see, cultivars that, that work um, besides Chandler that our growers have been happy with, um, Wendy, Lamour. Um, Wendy's got a really nice flavor. I'm really impressed with the flavor and the size on that one. Lamour's just done well for us pretty much in every aspect of production, um, size, quality disease resistance, the, the whole nine yards. And then Dora Select and Seneca are a couple of other cultivars growers are using that they seem to be happy with. Ones that haven't done so well um, for us, Early Glow, um, all the ones I have listed there, Early Glow, All Star, Ovation, Vantana, Gaviota. Um, we've had yield, low yields on those. Um, some of them really kick into runner production on the plastic and so though they might have been a great cultivar in matted row production you just end up with a lot of runners um, in, in plastic culture and not necessarily that much fruit. Now one other thing you can do if you have a particular cultivar that you really like um, as, as a cultivar in matted row production you can um, get dormant plants in that cultivar and try plugging your own plants just you know give it a shot, see how they do. We do have a couple of growers who are doing that. The real challenge is getting the plants into the cells. Um, they do need to trim the roots a fair amount um, and it just you know enough to get them to fit into to some sort of cells. We use larger cells, a 32 cell tray, um, but the cell depth can be an issue just getting them down in far enough. Now, the advantages of doing this is that you do know whether your plants are going to survive or not fairly early on. Um, and so, you know, you're just putting plants that, that, are, that are doing well out in the field. Um, it's easy to keep a close eye on them. It's easy to take runners off, you know, when they're right there um, in a condensed location. Plus, you can treat um, pests. But again, that does require some, some labor and having a structure to protect them. Now, other approaches, other approaches growers in the northern or cooler regions will use um, is holding their plantings over for a second year, um, for a second harvest year, and that, that seems to work quite, quite well. You may um, have some decrease in yields and berry size, but some of that is just related to management, um, to keeping the planting disease and insect free um, and keeping enough new um, nitrogen and water water on the planting. If you do decide to try that, um, you'll probably want to use uh, heavier plastic. We use a 1.25 mil embossed plastic and that gets us through two years um, just fine. Um, you don't have that much cost involved in keeping them for a second year because so much of your cost is up front. And typically what you'll do if you want to do that is mow them after fruiting. Um, we, don't, we do recommend that growers don't try for a third harvest year. Um, frequently folks will get through their second year and think the plants look pretty good, but they almost always get into trouble during that third year. And um, I'll explain to you a little bit why we sometimes have yield decreases in the second year and why we definitely will have yield decreases in the third year. Um, if you look at um, how a strawberry plant grows, Okay, the crown area is basically a compressed stem and you will have new roots growing right out of um, this area, right where um, the, the, the crown area, so you'll see some of these new roots that are coming out higher and higher on the crown as, as time goes by. Um, as new leaves are produced, this stem will become longer um, and taller and so what happens is as it gets higher, as the plant basically gets higher out of the ground, um, you do end up with more problems with winter injury and then besides that we often end up with um, some problems with um, insect and disease buildup. Um, you may end up with additional branch crowns and some smaller berries on them. But again if you keep the nutrition up there um, you know, you, that yield decreases into a definite in the second year. Now, a couple questions. Can you wait till the plants go dormant in the fall and snip off runners um, and start them in the spring? I would think that would be a little difficult to do. Um, you could you could give it a try, but I really doubt that the plants would, would go that long. Because um, if the plants are dormant in the fall, you're still going to have a fairly vegetative 
you know, runner there, and I really think it'd be a little difficult to keep them in good enough shape um, in, until the springtime. Even even a period of three or four months, I think, might be a little difficult to do. Marv, um, if you can, um, if you would care to wave weigh in on any thoughts on that one, I'd, I'd appreciate your thoughts there. And yes, um, Richard's comment on Oriental beetle that seems to be more of a problem the further east you go. We've also had some problems with strawberry rootworm, is one where we've had an issue with. Um, in in um, carrying plantings over. So, alrighty. Um, one other thing, growers will ask about. Um, typically, you'll put on a fall row cover. Um, if you do decide to go with um, fall um, with fall planted or well late summer or, or early fall planted plug plants, um, and you are delayed. Um, you know, what do you do in that situation? It is possible to put a fall row cover on um, fairly early. Um, typically, we will say that um, you'll apply a row cover when the temperatures, when the high temperatures for a day are, e they are either in the high 60s or low 70s, day after day. You can move that up by a few weeks um, and, and try to get a little more growth on the plants um, and adjust. So, yeah. So Marv's comment, um, dig them in the fall and plant them in the spring, that, that may be, um, you know, basically yeah, the runner tips just, just may not be the way you would want to go on that. Um, but dormant plants um, might be a, be a way to go there. So thank you, Marv. Um, fall row cover application. Um, just coming back to that, if you do put it on early, and I mean by uh, two to three weeks um, ahead of when you normally would expect your temperatures to, your daytime highs to be in the high 60s or low 70s, um, if you put the row covers on two to three weeks ahead of that, you can make up for some of the yield loss by um, planting the plants or plug plants late, but um, you just never make, make back the yield loss completely. One other thing I want to point out is if you do that, for some reason it does advance the spring harvest season. And that could be either good um, or bad. There's just this carryover effect from putting row cover on in September that carries over and makes the plants actually bloom um, earlier in the springtime. And that's that was something that surprised us a little bit. I also just want to throw out the possibility um, of growing day neutrals on plastic just because w um, we've been doing work with them for about the last three years and they seem to really, really work well on plastic, um, seascape in particular. Um, and so, you know, if you do have an interest in growing day neutrals or y and you think you have a market for them um, for off-season berries, um, you know, definitely day neutrals work as well. So this isn't a system that's only for June bears. Um, do day, neutrals, day neutrals also work well in tunnels, and um, which Lewis will be talking about in a, in a little while. So um, row protection, I'd mentioned our cold temperatures. Um, choices, you can hope for a consistent row cover that may not, um, may not do this. Um, it looks like there, there are some folks who are growing the um, the day neutrals. I want to take a couple questions here. Um, you know, our market for day neutrals really seems to vary with who is growing them and where they are located. Um, some people have had, you know, have been able to sell everything they can produce. Others, um, you know, are having trouble moving them. So it just seems to depend on the situation. Yes, the um, for day neutrals, we actually are planting the plants in the springtime. And we, what we ended up doing was using dormant plants. We plugged them ourselves in April, planted them um, in May, and then could get good yields off of them for that first summer. And then um, we would carry them over for a second year and get the production off for the following springtime. After that, the size just decreased too much to really um, be happy with, with the um, just the production after that point. We were just getting a lot of small berries when we were getting into the second half of our second year on plastic. Okay, coming back to our plastic culture, the winter protection. Um, you do want to use row covers if you're in a fairly warm area, meaning, um, you know, you hardiness zone 6A, 6B, or, or slightly warmer than that. If you get into cooler areas, um, it, it seems that straw does does help a lot with getting the plants through the winter. 
just putting straw on top alone hasn't worked that well for us. Um, it seems to work for some other folks. We've just had difficulty with it blowing off, and maybe it's just our our lack of consistent snow cover um, to hold it down, and and the fact that we have a windy site where our research plannings are. What's worked better for us is using straw underneath a row cover. I do want to point out that when you put straw on a plastic culture planting, at that point you don't really get any, you know, light into the plant anymore. Um, pretty much, it, you know, brings any plant activity to a halt there. But um, we'll put the straw on later than we would on a matted row planting. Normally, we will pull our, our row covers on during the fall to get that get some increased temperatures and in plant growth during the fall. And that raises the soil temperatures, and so it's going to be later that the plants are going dormant. So we are actually have always been very close to Christmas by the time we put our straw on. Um, so we're really talking the end of December to do that. And um, so what we will end up doing is actually p putting the row cover on for the fall, pulling it off, putting the straw down, and then pulling the row cover back over again. And you do want the plants to be fully dormant when you do this. So they should you know, have that reddish color to them, be a bit flattened um, underneath the row cover before you do that. Okay, so the other issue, um, frost protection, and that's not just a northern thing, that's, that's anywhere. It's a problem everywhere, but what's really worked well for us is either using overhead irrigation, um, and we'll actually put the irrigation um, sprinklers on over um, top here. You can see one of the lines, I think, right down through there, um, over top of the row cover. And the advantage of this is you can use the row cover for a lot of the frost protection. Um, and it's only really once the temperature reaches close to freezing underneath the row cover that you need to turn on the overhead irrigation. So th that's cut the amount of overhead irrigation we need um, to about half of what we'd need if we didn't have the row cover. And um, you can also use a double layer of row cover. That's what I've gone to the last few years. Uh, our thickness on the straw layer, um, you want that to be same as in a matted row planting, about four to six inches of, of fluffed straw. Over top of the over top of the plants. So let's see. We're going to move on. So what are our options for making plastic culture work um, in the northeast or cooler regions? Using um, plug plants if they're available certainly is good. But if you can get them early enough, but you know, like I say, there are some issues with that. Um, dormant plants is the other option. Carrying them over for s a second harvest year seems to work well consistently. Um, and then you, know, you can also do plastic culture in high tunnels, but there you get into more costs, and we'll let Lewis get into um, to that a little bit. So I just want to do basically a, a, a brief review of what um, we would, what we do, um, and some of the things that we've talked about to to get a plastic culture planning to work. Um, in some cooler areas, you know, you'll start out with your field, you'll do the soil test, do all the things you would for any planting, um, except we'll normally work in about 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre, which is a little higher than what we recommend for matted row production. Make our raised beds in spring, early summer, sometime um, ahead of time so that you have those ready to go. And then plant dormant plants. Um, Mid-July works well for us. We need to adjust um, that for other regions. The further north you go, um, seems to you seem to need to go a little earlier. Further south, you can go a little later. Um, or use plug plants, um, and you can use those from either tips um, that you root yourself or from dormant plants in mid-August, or tips that if you can get them from a nursery. Um, go through um, removing runners, keeping the planting watered, um, apply row covers in the fall once temperatures, um, your highs get, um, you know, not out of the low 70s. Um, apply straw mulch um, um, to get them through the winter in addition to the row covers. And then in the springtime, you'll take the straw off when your soil temperature is right around 40 degrees. Same time, um, base at same time, same stage of plant growth as you might have um, in a matted row planting. Just if you start to see the plants starting to grow, it's time to take the straw off. And then you'll leave your row cover there. You can pull the row cover back on if you want to advance harvest. You can leave row cover off if you want to delay your harvest. But definitely you'll want to pull your row cover back on for frost protection. Um, have your overhead irrigation ready to go. At that point, we'll start fertigating through the uh, trickle system. Um, one to two pounds of nitrogen per week seems to well work well for us. 
go through harvest. Um, if you want to carry them over for a second year, you can basically mow um, the leaves off the plants, and that's all you'll do, but then keep them watered. Um, resume some of the fertigation to get them get them going. You won't need row covers for that second fall um, because you should have plenty of plant growth out there already, but you will want to protect them for the winter. And then you just continue um, once you get, um, you know, into that second winter, then you'll just, you know, go on through with removing straw the following spring and harvesting. And that's it in a nutshell. So, um, um, Laura, if people wouldn't mind, I think we're going to hold the questions on. till the very end, just to make sure that we have plenty of opportunity for Lewis to, to speak. And Kathy, I want to thank you. That was great. Yes. Um, let me just quickly uh, change these um, pods here and put Lewis's presentation up. And I'd like to introduce our second speaker um, today. Lewis, Dr. Lewis Jett is the Associate Professor of Horticulture and the Extension Specialist for Vegetables and Small Fruits at the University of West Virginia. And he's also done a lot of work in Missouri. Um, he had a handout that will be available for you folks at the very last portion of our um, session and that you can download onto your own computer and I'll make sure to point that out to you. And then one other thing that I forgot to share with everyone, um, let me just see if I can make sure to show this. If you can follow my cursor, if you go to full screen, for those of us, um, for those of us who like to see the screen really big, I'm going to enable you to change it yourself so each one of you can push full screen and make it take up the screen and then you uh, don't look at the attendee list or the chat but that's up to you to do to do that okay um, without further ado I'd like to introduce Dr. Jett okay thank you Laura I appreciate you inviting me for this um, webinar series uh, on, on strawberry production and um, I mostly work with vegetables uh, in high tunnels, but the small fruits are a new area that we've been we've been looking at, and so I want to cover some of the integrated crop management techniques that um, you would typically um, use if you're if you're growing uh, strawberries within a high tunnel. I think many of you know what a high tunnel is, but for those of you who who haven't uh, encountered one of these structures, they're they're really just uh, an advanced uh, way to extend the growing season and uh, particularly through the Northeast, the New England, Mid-Atlantic region, there's a, a major uh, adoption of this type of technology to, to lengthen the growing season and to exclude pests, uh, particularly uh, organic growers find them uh, a great tool for, for growing uh, crops organically without pesticide use or limited pesticide use. Um, and um, here in the, um, the Mid-Atlantic region in West Virginia and even in the Midwest where I was at before, um, we were able to extend the growing season on most crops um, by three months. But if you be really creative with these high tunnels, you can actually get three crops within a, a 12 month period. Um, so you're, you're able to grow a lot of food um, in a very limited space uh, in a um, in a, in a year, so that's, that's that's certainly reason why they're becoming popular. They let you grow uh, crops that you normally couldn't grow at your uh, latitude or your region, and so it opens the door for growing crops um, out of their traditional season, and even varieties that may be sensitive to cold weather. Uh, by putting them in a high tunnel, you're protecting them from extreme cold, and you're able to grow them much farther north than what you normally could. And then finally, they're, they're used to supplement field production. So many, many growers who <coughs> use these high tunnels use them mostly for early season production, sometimes late season production, but they're also complementing what they're also growing in the field. So there's just a continual uh, supply of food over a very long period of time. So that's why they have um, uh, been rapidly adopted. And there are many <coughs> shapes and designs on high tunnels. 
I've seen so many permutations on size and and uh, <clears throat> in wall designs and and, uh, and 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 whatever. But but generally um, they are a solar greenhouse. Uh, you're trapping uh, uh, radiant energy from the sun and you're using that to, as I said, to, to advance the growth of the crop. And, and generally, um, most people who, who define a high tunnel claim they only have one, or should have only one layer of plastic. But I think the farther north you go, uh, a, a double layer of plastic on a high tunnel is, is a, a great benefit. Um, so, you know, you could either have one or, or a double layer of plastic uh, with the structure. <coughs> So uh, what they what they also do is, as I said, um, accumulate heat over time, and this is just a uh, temperature graph of uh, high tunnel versus ambient. Uh, this happens to actually be one of our strawberry um, uh, high tunnels, and without looking at the the actual numbers, what we found is just a single layer of uh, a plastic high tunnel. Uh, increases the average daily temperature from seven to ten degrees per day, so that's that's fairly significant for for crop growth over time. <clears throat> we did a survey on uh, what is grown in high tunnels, and these are some of the most popular crops. Um, I think most of you probably would expect crops like tomatoes and salad greens to be uh, widely grown in high tunnels because they're high volume, long season crops with high value. Uh, but strawberries are becoming a popular crop uh, for high tunnels uh, and also other small fruits such as brambles which I think will be discussed um, a little later on in this uh, in this uh, webinar series. Um, so there's a question on finding a, a reasonably priced temperature monitoring system. Um, well, the one that we are using uh, to monitor temperature uh, is just a uh, uh, either a watchdog or a uh, uh, what they call a hobo data logger and it can log temperature for you and we also use uh, wireless thermometers uh, to, to uh, uh, monitor temperature so I'm not quite sure the price differences between those those different uh, different types but uh, as I'll talk about later temperature management in these high tunnels is crucial uh, because one of the benefits, uh, as, I, as I said, is accumulating heat, but they're also manually vented. So uh, it's up to the operator to control temperature as much as possible. So it can either be a too hot or too cold, and that could actually be detrimental to the, the particular crop. So we're going to be talking about strawberries, and I think strawberries um, are a perfect crop for high tunnels, mainly because um, they are an early season crop. And uh, I preach to my growers here in West Virginia that we need more supply of early season crops and, and berries fit very well within that, that mix. Um, the big question is whether they're profitable to be grown in a high tunnel and uh, that depends on a couple of factors which I'll talk about um, a little later on. As farmers markets open earlier, uh, you know, there is a strong demand for berries. So early season berries uh, um, there is a premium price for them, uh, not quite as much as there is for early season tomatoes, but it, it is uh, fairly uh, fairly profitable. So why grow high tunnel strawberries? Well, I recommend that whenever you, you choose a crop to grow in your high tunnel, and there are there are scores of crops that you can can produce in the high tunnel. It depends on your your particular market, but there are really two things, um, two criteria that I look at. When I, when I choose a crop and it has to have high value and also high, high volume or high yield potential and there are some crops that have high value but don't yield much per plant and that's, that's sort of a problem so remember those two criteria as we, as we go along uh, when we talk about this crop. Now a lot of growers who adopt high tunnels uh, on their farm as I said earlier with the survey use it for tomatoes Tomatoes grow vertically. They, they yield a lot of fruit per plant. Uh, there's a high there's a high price for early season tomatoes. So um, maybe eight out of ten high tunnel producers uh, grow tomatoes. Either either uh, in, entirely in the high tunnel or in combination with other crops in the high tunnels. But strawberries could possibly be a, a good crop rotation choice uh, for tomatoes or 
complement tomato production in the, in the um, high tunnel. Now, Kathy uh, mentioned different types of strawberries, uh, the day neutrals and the short date or June bearer types. Most of my work and experience with growers has been with the June bearers, although I think the farther north you go, uh, the day neutral types uh, have tremendous potential. Uh, we have just started a project uh, this year with growing day neutrals in, in, in the high tunnels. I don't have the, the data compiled yet, <clears throat> but I, I think particularly these types of crop, these types of strawberries that do well in cooler weather um, would be very well suited uh, to uh, uh, farther north, such as the day neutral types. <clears throat> okay. Uh, one thing that I, I highly recommend when you grow any crop in the high tunnel is, is to make sure that you have the soil tested prior to planting the, straw, uh, the strawberries in the high tunnel. Uh, and this is just a picture of, it's kind of hard to maybe see what it is exactly, but uh, let's see. But this area through here, the, 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 white, the white area, uh, the, the crusty area is actually sort of salt deposits that build up in the high tunnel uh, from repeated fertigation of, uh, of different types of fertilizers. And I've had a lot of growers um, uh, have questions about that, whether that is you know, causing the salt levels in the soil to be very high. So uh, we recently tested this soil and uh, the, so the salt levels are very high right around the emitters, but the rest of the soil does not have very high salt levels. The reason I mention this is um, Strawberries are very sensitive to salt. Uh, they are, uh, they will show, uh, they will show damage. Uh, you can see here, they will show damage uh, to the tissue uh, from salt injury. I think I have a picture of that in a moment. This is salt damage to uh, to strawberries. Uh, some of the uh, marginal necrosis on the leaves that you see here, and. Uh, so if you're putting down a, a lot of fertilizers in the high tunnels, particularly ammonium nitrate or urea, you could have a salt buildup. Or if you're using certain animal-based uh, compost, animal manure-based compost, you can have high salts too. So just something to, to be aware of. So have your compost tested. Um, as I showed earlier, this is compost that we put in our high tunnel or one of our high tunnels um, as a soil amendment. It's an animal uh, manure-based compost. And uh, again, like I said, it's, it's important to have that uh, test either at the uh, your local uh, state uh, land grant uh, soil testing lab or a private lab. Uh, is there a difference between everbearing and day neutral strawberries? Uh, I think yes, there is. I, I know Marvin Prince would have a better answer for that than I would, but. Uh, most of the varieties you know that we have looked at have been strictly I think day neutral types the ever bearer types um, which are still Um, does everybody hear Back Lewis there. now? I, I lost him there for a second, and I, I think you're okay now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. Uh, the other thing, too, to remember is if you are using compost, if you are uh, inclined to use more organic amendments, is to have the compost tested, uh, not only, as I said, for salts, but also for pH and other, and other nutrients. Most compost is 1 to 2 percent. Uh, nitrogen. It can be very high in potassium and sometimes phosphorus, uh, depending on the, the source. And uh, surprising to some um, folks, it can have also very high pH. So, using too much compost can actually create problems for crops like uh, like strawberries. So, but you can also use uh, synthetic fertilizers to amend the soil. Now, when we we grow crops in the high tunnel, uh, the crop is grown directly in the soil under the structure. Now, I, I have nothing against using soilless uh, mixes, and I know there's some folks here that, that use the uh, compost bags 
and uh, which I think have great potential, particularly if you can't move the high tunnel or you aren't able to leach um, the soil in the high tunnel enough uh, through natural rainfall. So I see some potential for using soilless systems in high tunnels, um, and I don't entirely rule them out. Although, you know, the majority of growers are using the, the native soil underneath the structure to grow the crop, and if possible, the uh, uh, the strawberries should be placed on raised beds, and these are these can be made uh, manually, uh, which we have a lot of growers do, and then they, uh, there are some companies that sell a compact bed shaper, which makes a really nice uh, uh, crown bed that you can uh, you can plan on uh, in the high tunnel, so similar to this. <clears throat> Or you can use a flat, uh, flat row system, but uh, generally I like to use uh, uh, raised bed. The optimal planting date uh, is really dependent upon your region of the country, and uh, uh, you know, like I said, it's very difficult to generalize. With there's so many different different uh, uh, folks here on the in the meeting, but, but I think the one way to look at it, maybe as a rule of thumb is to look at your, your, your field planning date and um, the high tunnel gives you almost an extra month so your planning window is expanded by three maybe perhaps four weeks um, of, over what your, your field planning date is for these, these particular types of strawberries so that's one of the reasons why you know people like high tunnel production is it gives you just a larger window um, to, uh, to get your crops planted so as Kathy was saying, if it's difficult to get plugs that early in August, in early August, or even late July in some regions, well, with a high tunnel, you have a longer planting window, you can perhaps get plugs uh, a little bit later in the year. So, um, <clears throat> but the problem is, that if you plant uh, too late, as she mentioned, you just don't get the, uh, uh, the uh, vegetative growth and the uh, flower bud initiation uh, in the fall, and your yields are dramatically reduced. So. Sometimes it's trial and error, and I know some folks maybe in your region have been doing some research with planting dates, and that's that's probably something you should look at. <clears throat> Different uh, planting um, arrangements on um, high tunnel strawberries uh, will go with a two-row bed uh, or more, but if you're using a two-row bed, <clears throat> uh, we recommend putting on two uh, two lines of drip tape uh, on the uh, on the bed. So for every row of uh, of berries you have in the high tunnel, you should have one row of drip tape because, uh, again, you're protecting the crop from rain and the crop's entirely dependent upon you for water. So uh, you, you want to make sure that you're providing enough water and nutrients, nutrients to the crop. So uh, uh, particularly if you move to a three or four row bed on strawberries, uh, you need to have you know three to four drip lines per, per bed. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, that's a typical planting arrangement there. Some growers have tried four row beds, and we have tried it uh, as well in some of our research. Th the problem you get into with these high tunnels is that you're looking at two to three thousand square feet in the high tunnel, or if you move to a hay grove system where you have you know multiple bays, you can have a larger area. But the the inclination is to crowd plants in there, and I think that's a mistake. Um, because you can get more production from less from an optimal plant population than you could by just really packing plants in tight. So that's what we found with the four row bed uh, on strawberries is that uh, you're actually you're paying you're, you're paying more for for extra plants but you're not getting that extra yield. Um, so we have found a two or three row bed to be optimal uh, for uh, for planting uh, in these these uh, these structures. <clears throat> Okay, so how many plants can you can you get in there? You can get anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 strawberry plants uh, per commercial high tunnel, and this would be a typical spacing. Uh, I sort of like to go almost equidistant uh, between plants and between rows, 12 to 15 inches between plants, and and the same the uh, the same distance between rows on the bed, and sort of a typical uh, staggered uh, planting arrangement like this. Uh, I think that would be ideal. <clears throat> Width of the bed can be anywhere from uh, 24 inches to as wide as almost uh, 40, 42 inches wide. And, uh, 
This is a four row bed with three drip lines per bed. And the plants are very crowded in there. And it's led to uh, 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 some aphid problems. Lewis, could problems, I? So, uh, Lewis, excuse me. Um, uh, Chautauqua County has a question that I think is pretty pertinent about how big is that tunnel? Do you know the measurements of the tunnel? Well, most of the tunnels that, uh, that we've been working with or using our research are uh, oh. 20 to 30 feet wide and 96 feet long. So that's a typical. Okay, thank typical, you. Uh, and I think it looks like you might be starting to talk about Sue Gwise's question, um, talking about uh, substrate systems that she asked, and it looks like you might touch on that now. Well, yeah, I just, my only comments about it is, I mean, we have just started this year growing uh, strawberries in um, elevated gutters, and I don't have data to share on that, but you know, there's some interest in sort of the vertical growing systems in these high tunnels. And um, I think there's some potential there, but there have been some problems with, uh, with yield um, per plant. So someone needs to, to really work up uh, a, a design where there's less uh, uh, sh uh, shading by individual plants and the yield levels are high, uh, you know, from top to bottom. There was a recent article in the Vegetable Growers News, I believe it was in the June issue, where a grower up in Michigan was, was looking at vertical growing systems, and actually he's, he's designed uh, a system he thinks works. But I think that's some of the issues that we need to, to look at in the future, is, is growing these plants more vertically, getting more plants, and also getting higher yield per plant. Because if you're just growing in, just in a flat system in the, in the soil, as I said, you can get a fixed optimal number of plants, but um, uh, at some point your yield level has to be high enough to make it profitable. Um, capital cost per square foot of a high tunnel, um, generally um, they're two to three dollars per square foot uh, is, is, is generally what they average. And there's, like I said, there's a lot of variance in, in that estimate too because uh, uh, it, depending on whether it's a Manufactured high tunnel or a homemade high tunnel, um, the cost can be can be pretty uh, pretty wide. But what a lot of our growers have been doing, uh, and I think it might be the case throughout the the uh, Northeast, is poaching uh, old greenhouse frames from uh, nurseries or, or, or greenhouse businesses that are going out of out of business, and then using those frames for high tunnels. And all they have to do is just add a uh, a uh, hip board to it so that they can roll up the sides and get cross ventilation. So, um, well, I think it depends, like I said, on a, on a 30 by 96 high tunnel, the, the, the one that we are about ready to put plastic on in about two weeks, uh, it's probably cost around $7,000 uh, with every, every component to it. But um, again, like I said, that, 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 uh, that price varies depending on the, on the manufacturer. Uh, the varieties that you can choose from are, um, are you know, they're a fairly wide group of varieties. These particular varieties um, are ones that are bred primarily for plastic culture. And of course, you're probably familiar with most, most of these, uh, Chandler, Camarosa, and Sweet Charlie, and Ventana, and even Festival. Those are the ones that we've grown in the high tunnels. But I, I think there's, a, there's a, a lot of potential for other short day varieties that Kathy mentioned, such as the Wendy, Lamore, Dar Select, and the Seneca, um, as varieties that could be potentially later than these varieties. And so a mix of these varieties plus some of those uh, other June berry varieties could give you a longer production season. But our, our most uh, consistent variety has been Chandler. Um, and I, I know it's been tried and tested in many regions of the country. But it, it, it seems, that's not Chandler in the picture there, but it's festival actually, but uh, it, it seems to, to have consistently high yields um, and the flavor that uh, most growers like for, for, uh, for local markets. So, um, but I think the, uh, the other varieties that were mentioned uh, could, could certainly uh, complement Chandler as varieties uh, to add to your high tunnel. So the, uh, the reason I mentioned uh, Plants, um, I mean, uh, yes, I was just noting the comment on using the old uh, 
hoop houses uh, that were modified. I, I think that's that certainly is is the way to to uh, start in the high tunnel production is to is to recycle um, frames as much as possible, and, uh, and 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 then that way you can you can certainly cut the, the, the startup costs because they're immediately profitable, and you can recover your cost within a year, and then if you want to. You know, purchase a, a brand new frame the following year. You certainly would have the money to do it. Um, just sort of adding on to what Kathy was saying about um, plants for uh, for growing strawberries or plant sources or plant types. Um, I I mention this because um, the single biggest production cost of growing strawberries in high tunnel is plant costs. Um, so you have some choices here on different types of plants that you can that you can uh, use. You can buy your own runner tips and, and root the plugs yourself and um, or you can get bare root plants uh, or you can get plugs ready to plant and we, we've done all three. So um, the most economical uh, is probably going to be rooting your own runner tips if you can get runner tips in time. But like I said because your planting window has been expanded by the use of the high tunnel you have more time to get plant material um, for the uh, for your high tunnel structure. Okay, and these are some strawberry plant suppliers. Laura mentioned the handout that I um, I have that accompanies this presentation. That all this is 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 uh, listed within that um, uh, in that uh, that handout. <clears throat> well, okay. The question was um, two thousand plants, one pounds of strawberries per plant um, in the ground for four to six months. So that's that's approximately correct. I mean, uh, one pound per plant. It should be your your base your base yield. It should be the yield that you should at least get. Um, if you're not getting a pound per plant, um, the economics just don't uh, don't work out for high tunnel strawberries. So you should be somewhere in the in the one and a half pound range. Um, I believe. Uh, that actually with some of these day neutral types although they have a longer production season longer picking season you can actually get close to two pounds per plant but for these June bearer types you should be getting at least a pound in order for this to cash flow um, and to, to to make it profitable for high tunnels because for every crop that you choose in a high tunnel there's another cho there's another crop choice that can replace it so they have to be profitable uh, for that to, to be a good choice. Uh, just the cycle on, on growing the plants in the, in, the, uh, in the high tunnel structure. Generally for the varieties that I mentioned earlier such as Chandler and Camarosa, they're planted in the fall uh, and, and the planting date could be anywhere from late July through mid-September uh, depending on your, on your region. But they're planted, they grow through the fall, uh, the high tunnel keeps them warm, they put on good vegetative growth, they, 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 they uh, develop branch crowns. And then um, row covers are sort of interesting to use in a high tunnel because um, there really is no exact formula for using them like what Kathy was saying with the uh, field, uh, field production. Um, actually by using row covers in high tunnels you can get you know very early flowering on some of these varieties. And um, some of these varieties such as Sweet Charlie have very shallow dormancy or no dormancy at all and so they will actually flower in January or February if, if, it, uh, if it's warm enough um, so you can lose uh, production because of early flowering. So you don't want to put the row cover uh, on these high tunnel strawberries too early. Um, and we use a medium weight uh, to heavy weight row cover which is one ounce to one and a quarter ounce row cover. We find that to be most effective. But um, I, I, think, I think I can speak generally and say that you shouldn't use a row cover in a high tunnel before December. I, I think that's a, that's a pretty safe uh, thing to say. <clears throat> now we have used it um, in our projects primarily for extreme freeze protection. So if the, if the uh, ambient temperature was going to get um, below 20 Fahrenheit, we would be using row covers for protection on that. Uh, but we would not keep the row covers on the, on the strawberries continually. Um, 
and we would use it the following spring when uh, they begin to flower, so for frost protection. So we were sort of uh, using it uh, intermittently through the, uh, through the, uh, the season. <clears throat> so um, again, like I said, you don't, you don't want to, to use, it, uh, use it too soon. A lot of growers use either the floating row cover, cover or will use a low tunnel, which is supported by hoops, and um, either way is, it can be used, although you do get more uh, heat build up with a, with a, a low tunnel versus uh, just a floating row cover. Okay. Uh, now generally when the plants are going into dormancy in December in the high tunnel, uh, you know, they sort of flatten out and we'd like to see about four to five branch crowns on the, on the, uh, the, uh, the strawberries and the, the, the diameter of the uh, rosette uh, should be about five to six inches in, uh, in uh, length. And that's a good, uh, you know, starting point for how uh, how your plants should be going into uh, dormancy. The problem that we had last year uh, with a lot of growers is they uh, we had a very cloudy fall, and we didn't get a lot of, uh, of uh, growth in the fall, so yields were much lower this year for a lot of growers. So that that is something that could could be a problem in certain areas. Um, if you plant too early in the high tunnel, you can get runner production. Um, and that's something that you don't want on plastic because these these plants are grown on plastic mulch under a plastic cover and there's no place for the runners to root and you're not creating a matted row so you want to just have one central uh, mother plant producing large fruit from five five branch crowns roughly ten flowers per branch crown but no daughter plants so you will need to pull those daughter plants off uh, probably a good indication that you're keeping your high tunnel too warm is you're getting you're getting runner production. So uh, that that would be an indication of, of maybe poor temperature management, which leads me into this issue of temperature management in the high tunnel because this always surprises growers at how much time they have to spend uh, adjusting the vents um, in these structures. So you see the vents on on these high tunnels on the side and um, you know, you generally want to keep uh, the high tunnel on the cool side for strawberries because they are a cool season crop. So, uh, you know, in days where it might get warm in, 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 in the late fall or even winter days where the temperatures can get warm, uh, you know, you may need to vent it. So, uh, rolling up the sides is not a, is, is not, uh, a bad thing to do even in the, uh, the middle of winter. Uh, is there more heat accumulation under high tunnels or low tunnels? Well, uh, uh, the thing about that is using low tunnels within high tunnels is, is extremely effective. So, I mean, you're, you're going to get it's sort of, uh, you know, syner synergism between the two that you get even more. But if you had a low tunnel out in the field, uh, you know, they do increase the, the air temperature around the plant but eventually they, they reach the ambient temperature much faster than what a high tunnel would. But when you put them in a high tunnel, you almost double the effectiveness of the row cover. So, um, you know, that's, that's one of the advantages of using uh, low tunnels within, within high tunnels. Um, okay, so also, as I said, if you're, if you're not venting your high tunnel uh, adequately, you can get premature flowering uh, on some of these varieties and um, the flowers are immediately frozen and that's lost yield uh, from the plant. <clears throat> there are some growers that, that will use backup heaters in high tunnels for a lot of crops and the backup heaters that are used for strawberries are only used for frost protection. Um, but, but generally if you use row covers, if you put your row cover on early enough in the day before uh, it gets cold that night, you can trap enough heat under the row cover within the high tunnel to prevent um, damage from a frost or a light freeze. If the temperatures got down into the teens, if you had a single layer of plastic, you would need a backup heater uh, to, to prevent damage. <clears throat> okay, so um, then take uh, routine tissue samples. I, I highly recommend that. 
That's done primarily at, fly, at uh, first flowering uh, the following spring. And uh, we take about 20 uh, leaf and petiole samples uh, per variety per high tunnel. That's usually enough to get you a test. And you can send it to either your diagnostic or your, your, your uh, soil or plant nutrition lab on campus or uh, through a private lab such as this. Pollination is an issue on, on strawberries and a lot of crops within high tunnels because uh, uh, the flowering is um, so early that uh, a lot of the natural pollinators aren't active yet. So uh, in, in, a lot of, in, in our case, in the Mid-Atlantic and in the uh, Midwest, um, these high tunnel strawberries would start flowering in mid to late March. Well, that's usually well before most natural pollinators become, become available. So uh, the strawberries need to get pollinated either by uh, air movement or by bringing in pollinators yourself. So uh, the question was, could an overhead sprinklers be used for fro frost protection in high tunnel? Um, yeah, I suppose they could, um, although uh, I, I really haven't used a lot of overhead watering in the high tunnel. Uh, you know, most of the, the watering is done through, through drip irrigation, but that certainly is one, one thing that you can do. I, I suppose if you could keep the water from freezing on the plastic uh, or anything like that that would cause any damage to the, to the uh, poly or, or any the, the structure like that. So uh, to solve the pollination uh, issue, you can uh, purchase a Class C uh, hive, which has two or three hundred drones in it, uh, and uh, or you can actually get small nuke boxes of honeybees, but uh, the, uh, the uh, bumblebees are, are very effective pollinators for, for strawberries. <clears throat> And if you don't get good pollination, or if the temperature is very cool when it's uh, uh, when they're flowering, you can often get misshapen fruit, which is uh, something you you don't want. So you want good quality, uniform fruit such as this. This is all high tunnel strawberries that you're seeing now. Um, and the frequency of harvest, uh, generally for these these June bearing types, um, that you're looking at about a a four a excuse me. A six to ten week period of harvest, but if you if you include day neutrals in, uh, you can uh, you can certainly extend that. Some things to consider on that's not running out of time on the pest management is spider mites and botrytis gray mold. Spider mite is the most chronic problem we've had with growing strawberries in high tunnels, and this is some typical symptoms of spider mites. Usually they develop within a a specific uh, area, the hot spot, usually the center of the high tunnel where it's warmest. But uh, we have been doing work with uh, uh, using predatory mites to control um, spotted uh, spider mites in high tunnels. And it's been very effective. The threshold is five, five mites per leaf. Uh, and by using Phytocelius, which is a predatory mite, we were able to bring that threshold down uh, to, or, or bring that mite level down to below the threshold. So there's a perfect place to use uh, predatory um, um, insects or mites is the high tunnel because you have an enclosed area, you have a very small space, and the uh, the the, uh, the uh, insects or mites work very effectively in those hot spots. This is particularly a problem if you're growing mixed crops in high tunnels. So there's a center row of strawberries here and a lot of different types of flowers. You can use predatory mites to control uh, mites on not only strawberries but also these other crops. We've used uh, la uh, lady beetles too. Aphids are a problem if you're over fertilizing with nitrogen or if you have too, uh, too much uh, lush growth on, the, uh, on the, uh, the, uh, the plant. This is Botrytis gray mold, which usually occurs during cloudy, cool, damp weather. Uh, we like to remove all the dead leaves as much as possible. This is substrate for Botrytis, so uh, you, want to, you want to keep those under control. There's some weed growth that occurs, typically winter annual weed such as uh, uh, chickweed um, occurs around the planting hole that sometimes need to be, be weeded. One of our other serious problems is voles or meadow mice and uh, they will get underneath the plastic, they'll overwinter in a high tunnel and they'll actually chew on the crown. So um, that's, that's an issue to face in the high tunnels. But you don't get deer damage uh, like this. So uh, if there's one advantage of the high tunnels. Uh, for strawberry growers is you do not get uh, deer browsing on the, uh, on the there. 
So um, the yields are 1.2 to 1.3 pounds. I'd like to be around 1.5 pounds per, per plant. If you can get that yield level, and you can get a price of three to four dollars per pound, which is what most growers have been getting, high tunnel strawberries can be very profitable. But you have to get that yield level and you have to get that price range. And if you look at the handout, it has all the production costs and the different returns for different prices and yields on strawberries that you can look at and see if you're actually uh, making a profit or not. So I will close it there. And uh, certainly want to visit maybe the Cornell High Tunnel website and our high tunnel website that uh, sort of uh, accumulates information from a lot of different Lewis, thank, thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate, I'm sorry to have to kind of move this along, but we have a limited time. And I, um, what I'm going to do here, we're moving into the final aspect of the talk. There are three polls that I'd love if people just wanted to give some response um, to this information while we finish up. And then in the file share, the upper right corner are several different, um, one is the handout that was sent to you in advance uh, from Kathy Demchek, and then the other two are similar but slightly different um, uh, handouts from Dr. Lewis Jett about high tunnel growing and so you can upload those to your own computer. Um, the other thing I want to remind everyone of is on Tuesday, September 22nd, we have a um, insect, uh, strawberry insect um, pest uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Richard Coles from the University of Connecticut and Dr. Greg Loeb from Cornell University are going to be talking about um, root weevils and uh, sap beetle and tarnished plant bug respectively. And I do hope um, all of you will get that announcement for connection and if you can make it wonderful. Uh, if you can't just disregard the announcement, but we decided to start sending because we're getting so much activity for the registration, it was just easier to keep all of you in one list and send it out. Um, but before we log off, if anybody else has any questions for either Kathy Demchek or Lewis Jett, um, we could take those now just for a couple of extra minutes. Um, I know there was one question that was a asked several times. Um, what is the difference between, uh, oh, uh, Kathy answered that, great. Um, no real difference for between day neutral and ever bearing. Um, pro possibly day neutral might not be quite correct. And Yeah. Um, yeah, Laura, all it is is really the day neutrals aren't really day neutrals, and right now there seems to be moved into okay. them all repeat flowering, which Okay, great. That's good really to know. Nice. So all right. Does anyone else have, uh, okay, Heather Bryant, what is the optimum pH for growing strawberries? Do either of you? I can get Okay, good. So that was what yeah, I was going I'm to say, so I'm glad. Five <laughs> is what we generally <laughs> Um, is yeah, there any other questions? <laughs> it looks like a couple nice people are typing it. rapidly. Gwyn Smith, Forever Bearers, if I want to overwinter, do they need to be renovated like June Bearers? No, not on plastic, yep. Uh, no. Uh, any other questions? Looks like yeah. people have stopped typing and most people have um, responded to the polls and um, I think that's it then. We made it just in the nick of time for the log off. And I really want to thank again the Northeast IPM Center for funding this um, series of webinars. I want to thank Kathy Demchek of uh, Penn State University and uh, Dr. Lewis Jett from West Virginia University for their participation. And I look forward to seeing all of you or some of you on Tuesday, September 22nd. And if any of you have any comments and would like to email me, please feel free to do that. Thank you again for your participation.
Nora, are you still there? Lewis? <laughs> 